This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 1052, recorded on October 12, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses, Joining me today here in Boston, Massachusetts, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. So, Daniel, what are we doing in Boston? Well, we are recording at ID Week, Infectious Disease Week, where hundreds of infectious disease specialists, aficionados, people from industry, are gathered to learn about the latest and greatest in infectious disease. It's quite a meeting, really interesting, and uh, a good place to do a podcast like a weekly clinical update. I think, I think that would be great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna start off with my Boston-appropriate quotation. Those, those who are familiar with Boston, I guess no, no true Bostonian would trust a place that was sunny and pleasant all the time, but a gritty, perpetually cold and gloomy neighborhood, throw in a couple of Dunkin' Donuts locations and I'm right at home. And that's Rick Riordan. Who is Rick Riordan? Anyone, anyone know? He is know. A, he's a writer. He writes uh, the Percy Jackson books. There are a lot of teenage books. And actually, I have to say, they're great, Vincent. Um, his son, Rick Riordan's son, both hated history and suffered from dyslexia. Mm -hmm. And that was his inspiration to write these books where the, the heroes, the protagonists of the stories, suffer from dyslexia. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. a great way to learn about mythology. And okay. So great well, stuff. Plug, I, for, plug I, for the books. The only thing I disagree with is Dunkin' Donuts. I'm not a big fan <laughs> of Dunkin' Donuts. Okay. Well, that's how I know I was in Boston this morning when someone grabbed me coffee and they said, oh, the line was too long at Starbucks, so I went to Dunkin' Donuts where there's one on every corner. Well, there's a really good place not far from here. I don't remember the name of it. Okay. Not a chain. It's good. Okay. Sometimes it's best not to look for the chains. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's start off with a little bit of good news. Malaria. So our listeners may be aware that there are now vaccines for malaria. The first approved and widely distributed was RTS, -S, which is sold under the name Moschirix and produced by GSK, a pharmaceutical company located in London. I think they put that in there. So uh, this vaccine has uh, been given to nearly 1.7 million children in Ghana, Kenya, and Malawi since 2019, um, but there's supply issues, so the vaccine can't meet the demand. Now we have another vaccine, R21, um, which met the WHO's target of 75% efficacy at preventing the disease in a trial of 4,800 children who each received three doses, that seems like a theme, before a seasonal malaria peak. Um, a booster dose after 12 months maintained protection. Um, and uh, just to give you a sense, uh, that old vaccine, $9.80 per dose. This new vaccine, 2 to $4 per dose. It's great. And actually much easier to produce, so we should meet our supply issues, and it should be available in mid-2024. These are delivered intramuscularly? Yep. yep. Great. That's, so. so that amount of protection is great, 75%, right? It's, it's tremendous, actually. Yep. Yep. Protection against clinical disease. All right, and RSV, this is, I'm gonna say, like everyone, everyone pay attention to this because I think this is really important. Um, like why are we talking about RSV all the time? Um, so MMWR, disease severity of respiratory syncytial virus compared with COVID-19 and influenza among hospitalized adults aged greater than or equal to 60 years, IV network, 20 US states, February 2022 through May 2023, posted on October 6th. So the big takeaway from this report was that during February 2022 through May 2023, while hospitalizations for RSV were less frequent, they were associated with more severe disease than were hospitalizations for COVID-19 or influenza, um, including receipt of standard oxygen, high flow nasal cannula, uh, ending up on a vent, ending up in the ICU. So just to go through, to characterize this severity, they looked at 5,784 adults, 60 years of age or older, hospitalized with an acute respiratory illness and either a laboratory confirmed RSV, SARS-CoV-2, or influenza. They prospectively enrolled uh, from 25 hospitals uh, in 20 US states 
and they're going to go ahead and they're going to compare RSV disease severity to COVID, right, in our immune world here, uh, and influenza, and they're going to look at folks that require standard flow, that's less than 30 liters of uh, oxygen per minute, high flow nasal cannula, um, and other forms of non-invasive ventilation, such as CPAP, your BiPAP, um, ICU admission, and um, ending up on a ventilator or death. Now, they do point out that um, less people end up in the hospital with RSV compared to, um, to COVID, compared to flu. But if you actually compare the outcomes of those folks hospitalized with RSV, they're more likely to require oxygen therapy, more likely to end up with high flow nasal cannula, more likely to end up in the ICU. And I think this is the big one. They are twice as likely to end up on a ventilator or to die if you compare that directly to influenza. Why do you think they're, they're less likely to be hospitalized? Um, I think one thing is, is just the prevalence. There's, there's less RSV out there. Mm. So, I mean, I think that's one of the issues, right? If we had the same amount of RSV, you'd say, oh, well, it's less likely to get you to the hospital. Okay. But if you look at RSV infections, we, we see less of them. But when we do see them, if a patient ends up in the hospital, and this is a big change, right? If they end up in the hospital with COVID, if they end up in the hospital with flu, if they end up in the hospital with RSV, RSV is twice as likely for them to end up on a ventilator, end up not okay. surviving. And how, how do COVID and flu compare in this study? Let's see in this study, because we have the table. <laughs> so they actually look at uh, about 4,734 patients with, uh, with COVID-19. 58.2 are requiring oxygen. Uh, flu patients, uh, they have 746, 65.8. So sort of similar, mm. standard. Um, high flow versus non-invasive, similar, about 12, 14%. ICU admission, pretty similar. And then you get a little bit of a difference. 10% of the COVID patients um, die, 7% of the flu patients die, 13.5% of the RSV patients die. Basically, because people are always asking, how does COVID compare to flu? So there you go, it's very similar. Yeah. It's, it's, it's similar. But I think this is telling, right? Because everyone keeps saying, oh, it's over, you know, no one's dying of COVID anymore, and we're gonna get into numbers in a minute. But as you see in the study, 10% of these individuals who end up in the hospital with COVID did not survive. They either ended up on a ventilator or they died. Um, and a lot of times, as people probably know, we're making the decision ahead of time, should we even go ahead and put this person on a ventilator? Um, because the chance of getting off a ventilator mm. um, is single digits, very small for most people. And yes, I feel like you, you preempted this. <laughs> what is going on with COVID? What are the numbers like? So I, I actually, now I've started, you know, I was talking this morning about, uh, I used to wake up in the morning and look at my Johns Hopkins, um, you know, or maybe my world meter and compare the two. What's going on with COVID? Uh, now I, I look at BNO on, on X or Twitter, whatever it's called these days. Um, once a week, we get a nice update on what's going on. Um, new cases, still about a quarter million new cases um, here in the U.S. in last week. Um, states reporting it, 50 out of 50. Um, in hospital, we have 15,655. In the ICU, we have about 2,000. That's actually up about 10% from last week. Um, new deaths, we're seeing 1,466. So we're still seeing over 200 deaths a day in the U.S. Um, and these individuals who are dying, what distinguishes them from others? The majority of deaths are in individuals over the age of 65. And there's, they are vaccinated. So at this, at this point, the differentiator is not um, immunity or not, mm -hmm. right? People have been infected, they've been vaccinated. Very hard to find someone who's not been infected mm -hmm. or vaccinated. So what's the big difference? Um, they're older individuals, they have medical problems which put them at increased risk. And then what's the biggest one? not given early antiviral therapy. Yeah, that, we can't repeat that too much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we keep saying that. Yeah. But that's a big thing. Everyone's got immunity. There's only so much we can do at this point with vaccines sure. because we've got that immunity. We can get a little bit of a boost. Um, but what's a big, like 80, 90% reduction for these folks who are ending up in the hospital? I mean, look at, look at these numbers. 1,466 deaths, that should be reduced. 2,000 people in the ICU over 15,000 in hospital, um, those numbers should be reduced if we could. Someone at this meeting told me that 90% of those deaths, those people never got an antiviral. 
That is, yeah, not only is that true, um, but what's really disturbing is if a patient goes to their doctor and says, hey, I've got COVID, I understand there's this medicine, this Paxlovid, um, majority of those providers are, are not actually giving their patients access to the medicine. So we have a tremendous educational challenge there. All right, and what about the, the, the future, right? So we can go into uh, wastewater. And I have to say, everyone else is doing, doing really well except the Northeast, and I'm blaming it on uh, you Italians and the Columbus Day um, <laughs> celebration. So just to say that there, we were going in the right direction, but in the last week, we're actually seeing the country as a whole moving upward. It's all thanks to those Northeasterners. Well, you're, you're a Northeasterner, too. <laughs> I, I celebrated Native American Day, so I did not <laughs> contribute to this. <laughs> okay. All right. So we are going to move right into the early viral phase. So we sort of hit on this. Um, you know, we talked about this a lot last time. Um, and we'll, we'll go through this in detail because there's really a nice article that came out. Um, the article, Nermatrelvir, Ritonavir, and COVID-19 Mortality and Hospitalization, among patients with vulnerability to COVID-19 complications, uh, published in JAMA Network Open. Um, you know, and th this article got a bit of media attention um, because it seems to feed into this idea that, that the virus has changed, it's no longer working against the new variants. Um, so I'm just gonna go through this a little bit um, and then give some context. So these are results of a cohort study of adult patients in British Columbia, Canada, uh, between February 1st, 2022, February 3rd, 2023. Um, patients were eligible if they belonged to one of four higher risk groups, and they sort of break these down into um, CEV, uh, so clinically extremely vulnerable one, clinically extremely vulnerable two, um, and then they, they look at these um, different groups. Um, patients with COVID-19 who received Paxlovid, so the Nermatrelvir or Ritonavir, were matched to patients in the same vulnerability group, um, same sex, same age, same propensity scores. The primary outcome, I think this is important, was death from any cause or emergency hospitalization within COVID, with COVID-19 within 28 days. So that's, that's something I think we've harped on repeatedly. When someone talks about an outcome, we always have to ask what outcome? What, mm. what efficacy are we talking about? So anyone who ends up you know, I need to go to the hospital. Remember, this is Canada, so think about what may or may not make someone do that. They go ahead and they look at 6,866 individuals included in the study. Um, the mean age was 70. Uh, we have a range, 57 to 80, for the um, interquartile range. Compared with unexposed controls, treatment with nermatrelvir and ritonavir was associated with statistically significant reductions in the primary outcome in the CEV1 group, so that's severely immunocompromised. Um, we have 560 folks there. Um, in the CEV2 group, that's a moderately immunocompromised group. Um, that was a large, 2,628. Um, the CEV3 group, there was also a reduction, um, but in these 2,100 patients, it did not reach statistical significance. So a couple, couple things for us to look at. It was, Nice to get a chance to speak to some of my Canadian colleagues this morning. Um, Nermatrelvir ritonavir exposed individuals did not require a positive PCR test. Um, so they sort of just assumed that, well, if they got the drug, that was why they got it. Um, prescribing physicians were required to make sure their patient tested positive within five days prior to prescribing the drug. So not five days from symptom onset, but five days from a positive test. So we can walk through the timing here. Um, the big thing is to put this in context, right? We, we have patients here who may have had a positive test. They may have had symptoms past the window for Paxlovid benefit, but we're still seeing it. So um, I think a big thing here really is that timing. Um, and one of the things I do want to point out is we now have over 449 studies looking at real-world effectiveness of Paxlovid, but which ones hit the media? It's the ones where the sky is falling. In one of the subgroups, they did not reach statistical significance. It doesn't work. But that's not the, that's not the mm -hmm. appropriate or right conclusion. So we're in that first week. This is acute viral infection, right? And we're going to go through the, the different treatments. So number one, Paxlovid. We talked a lot last week about um, studies looking at 
is there really any kind of a rebound? Should we worry about it? The simple answer is no. Paxlovid is the number one recommended treatment by the NIH, by the CDC, um, by all the guidelines across. So number one, Paxlovid. Number two, we have remdesivir. Number three, we have Thor's hammer, molnupiravir. Four, convalescent plasma, just a uh, treatment option for the immunocompromised with no other options. Um, and then let's avoid doing harmful and useless things. And this one was so painful for me to read, Vincent. Can you imagine antibiotic use among hospitalized patients with COVID-19 in the United States, March 2020 through June 22, 2022, published in Open Forum Infectious Disease. So these are the results of a retrospective study to describe antibiotic use among U.S. adults hospitalized with a COVID-19 diagnosis. And so, you know, I, I understand to some degree that a patient shows up in the ER, the ER doc sees pneumonia, they don't yet know that it's a COVID-19 pneumonia, maybe they get that first dose of antibiotics, but what happens once they're hospitalized? Once an ID doc can get involved, once an internist can get involved, once, once the admitting hospitalist takes over? Well, despite a decrease in overall antibiotic use, most patients hospitalized with COVID-19 received antibiotics on admission, 88.1%, regardless of their critical care status. But do they continue to get antibiotics or is it just one dose? No, so that's the problem. It isn't just one dose. So this mm. isn't just getting a dose in the ER. This is they get admitted. Mm. They, they're not necessarily, I mean, I understand too. The other is they end up in the ICU. They're in the ICU, they're, they're super sick, you're not sure, you're erring on the side of antibiotics because you don't want to miss that septic patient. These are general floor patients, 70, 80% plus getting a course of antibiotics for a viral illness. And presumably they should have received an antiviral before getting in the hospital. Right? Well, I think, I think that's, that's the big thing, is that they shouldn't end up getting mm. these antibiotics. They should get antivirals. Mm. And then they don't end up in the hospital, and then we don't end up with these problems. All right, now there's another, and I think this is worth um, bringing to people's attention if they've been following this. And this is the article, One Week of Oral Camistat versus Placebo in Non-Hospitalized Adults with Mild to Moderate Coronavirus Disease 2019, a randomized controlled phase two trial recently published in CID. So Daniel, uh, can we tell folks what Camistat does? I'm gonna let you do that. I was hoping you'd, okay. let's, let's talk about viral entry and the different paths. So when the SARS-CoV-2 virus binds the plasma membrane in a respiratory tract cell, mm -hmm. also on the surface of that cell is a second protein called Tempress-2. Okay. It's actually a nice name, Tempress. It, it is, yeah. That is a protease that cleaves the spike of a SARS-CoV-2 particle and then the virus fuses with the cell membrane and the RNA goes in. So entry occurs at the surface via this Tempress 2 and Camistat is an inhibitor of Tempress 2. Okay, so that's how it works. And those cells in the respiratory tract have Tempress on the surface and that's where you're inhibiting entry. So I'm, I'm glad to see this because a long time ago, Camistat was going to be trialed and then the, the hydroxychloroquine thing happened and people mm -hmm. got uh, scared of looking at, at inhibitors of entry. Yeah. But, yeah. So this is good. Tell us what happened. Well, uh, and not good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I mean, this was interesting, too, because there, there was a lot of ideas that maybe as we had different variants, this temperous pathway was becoming more important. Correct. Right? So some of the people thought, well, okay, maybe even early on, if there was evidence that it didn't work, maybe now we have a variant that's going to be more susceptible. So let's go ahead. Let's do the trial. So they do the trial, um, phase two trial, 216 participants, 109 randomized to chemistat, 107 to placebo. 45% um, reported less than five days of symptoms at study entry, so we kind of want that early. 26% um, met the protocol definition of higher risk of progression to severe COVID-19. Um, younger, median age was 37. Um, unfortunately, no significant um, well, no significant differences in the levels of SARS-CoV-2 RNA on days three, seven, and 14. Um, through day 28, 5.6 participants in the Camistat arm and 4.7 participants in the placebo arm were hospitalized. One participant in the Camistat arm died, uh, no one in the placebo arm died. So 
phase two study, non-hospitalized patients, mild to moderate COVID-19 oral chemistat did not accelerate viral clearance or time to symptom onset or result in reduced hospitalizations or death. Okay, I have an explanation or potential explanation. Go for it, yeah. So, so the problem is that if you inhibit entry at the plasma membrane, the virus can be taken up by endocytosis and enter from an endosome. Because yeah. there's, there's a protease in the endosome, it's called cathepsin L, which will cleave the spike. So that's probably why this didn't work. If you want it to inhibit entry, you need to inhibit both Tempris 2 and cathepsin L. And there are drugs that will inhibit, and one of them is hydroxychloroquine, <laughs> but we don't want to use that. <laughs> It well, has... Yeah, I mean, that was one of the challenges, I think, early on, is people were saying, well, maybe you need to use, you know, the two drugs together. Correct. Um, the challenge, right, and I think it's important to remind everyone this, is that if we look at the hydroxychloroquine data, we probably increased mortality yes. by about 10%. Yeah. So it actually, it made things worse. So we don't really, at this point, want to, like, oh, maybe we just need to do that trial. Well, I, mean, I think that's why the camistat wasn't trialed with the hydroxychloroquine, because the HCQ has bad side effects. You yeah, don't want to use it that. does. So you need something else. Yeah, I mean, and not only the trials, I remember in the hospital, nurses would come to me, you know, Mr. Jones like vomiting in his face mask because of the GI side effects of hydroxychloroquine. Mm. So um, yeah, but we didn't okay. know, we didn't know early on. All right, so we've got through that first week. Hopefully our patients have gotten their early antiviral therapy. Hopefully they're not gonna show up during the second week. Hopefully we're not treating viruses with antibiotics. Um, but here we are with the article assessment of the available therapeutic approaches for severe COVID-19, a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials published in scientific reports. Um, so this is gonna really go through what are, what are all these different uh, treatments out there and what do we know about them from the different trials. So um, the authors conducted a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials um, compared with standard of care. Um, database searching was performed separately for each severe COVID-19 treatment such as Anakinra, remdesivir, baricitinib, ivermectin, ritonavir, tocilizumab, cerilimab, sotravimab, um, casimdevimab, and they, uh, they present the results in a risk ratio. We've got confidence intervals and other analysis. And they're really, there's a lot here. Nice analysis of risk of bias in the different included studies. They kind of start with that. And I think that's really key. You've got to really ask, like, okay, before we look at the studies, are they reliable? Is there a lot of bias? And then what I really love, lots of forest plots. So we can actually look at the individual studies and see how they factor into the analysis. So let's kind of walk through. But I do. This is open access. We'll leave a link in the show notes. Um, take a look at each one and the forest plots. So Anakinra, remember that? Maybe a trend toward more death. Remdesivir was favored over standard of care. Baricitinib was favored over standard of care. Ivermectin, apparently, if we only include studies that were actually done and not the fraudulent ones, ivermectin is not helpful. Okay, cue up the hate mail. And then yes, if you wait too long and try those monoclonal antibodies once a person already has severe disease, not so helpful. But what about tocilizumab? Well, they put this right up in the abstract, and this was interesting, so let me read. We obtained the most statistically significant outcomes favorable tocilizumab compared to standard of care for death incidence. We have a relative risk of 0 0.87. Um, need for mechanical ventilation, relative risk of 0 0.78. And number of patients discharged from the hospital, 1.13. So the authors conclude this meta-analysis has revealed that a considerable amount of research characterized by a very diverse methodology is available. Despite the limited data that met the criteria for inclusion in the meta-analysis, we show that the available treatment options for severe COVID-19 are effective. TOSI, TOSI is the IL-6 antibody, correct? Exactly. IL so these are people there. coming in later in infection and inflammatory phase. So it's not surprising that that was helpful, right? Yeah, so I think this is, I mean, this is sort of our paradigm that we've been talking about for a while, you know, which drugs we include, which we don't. So patient ends up in the hospital, they've got an oxygen saturation lower than 94%, and we should probably say we are seeing patients in the first week too, but this is that second mm -hmm. week classic um, cytokine storm, early inflammatory phase. So number one, steroids, six milligrams a day for six days. We've talked about the meta-analysis, reining that in from 10, no real benefit once you get to day six past day six. 
um, anticoagulation, we got a bunch of guidelines, pulmonary support, remdesivir if we're still in the first 10 days, and then immune modulation, and yes, tocilizumab mm -hmm. was the winner there, um, and avoiding those unnecessary antibiotics and um, antiparasitics. <laughs> All right, okay, and a, a, a area we've been spending a lot of time on lately, fortunately, is late phase long COVID. Um, let me start with the article, Effect of Monovalent COVID-19 Vaccines on Viral Interference Between SARS-CoV-2 and Several DNA Viruses in Patients with Long COVID Syndrome, um, recently published in NPJ Vaccines. Um, so for those following this story, right, there's been a lot of evidence now that Epstein-Barr virus, so EBV reactivation, um, other DNA viruses may be involved in long COVID symptoms. Um, there's also evidence that vaccination can both prevent and be an evidence-based treatment for long COVID. So here, the investigators evaluated the reactivation of several members of the herpes viridae family, so EBV, CMV, HSV, and parvovirus, uh, B19, another DNA virus that can reactivate in patients with long COVID syndrome. So clinical and laboratory data for 252 consecutive patients with PCR verified past SARS-CoV-2 infection and long COVID syndrome, so 155 vaccinated, 97 non-vaccinated, were recorded during April 2021 through May 2022. So we're about 200 median, 243 days post COVID-19 infection. DNA virus related IgG and IgM titers were compared between vaccinated and non-vaccinated long COVID patients with age and sex matched non-infected unvaccinated um, controls. Vaccination with monovalent COVID-19 vaccinations was associated with significantly less frequent fatigue and multi-organ symptoms, significantly less cumulative DNA virus-related IgM positivity, significantly lower levels of plasma IgG subfractions two and four um, for EBV, and significantly lower quantitative CMV IgG, IgM, and EBV IgM titers. So what we're saying here is if you're vaccinated, if, if you're not vaccinated, you're infected with SARS-CoV-2, it reactivates these other latent viruses, EBV and CMV, and mm -hmm. that can be a problem. Yep. And if you're vaccinated, that incidence goes down. That's, yeah, that seems to be part of this growing story that mm -hmm. people who develop long COVID, part of, part of the syndrome may be that they get this reactivation and... Right. Yeah, vaccination may be, this may be one of the mechanisms for why vaccines can be protective. So if you remember the, the Iwasaki paper we talked about here, yeah. reactivation of, of these DNA viruses was associated with long COVID, one of the yeah. associated factors, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. And uh, more bad news, <laughs> the article, local budesonide therapy in the management of persistent hypoosmia in suspected non-severe COVID-19 patients Results of a randomized control trial recently published in the National Journal of Infectious Diseases, right? So these people, they can't smell. We're hoping that some, some steroids squirted up the nose might do the trick. Um, we talked last week about a, another trial looking at this. So these are the results of a multicentric randomized superiority trial. The experimental group received uh, budesonide, a, a steroid, and physiological saline nasal irrigations administered via three syringes of 20 milliliters in each nasal cavity in the morning and evening for 30 days. Uh, the control group, uh, similar protocol, except no steroid in the, in the squirts. Patients were included if they were 18 years old with a SARS-CoV-2 infection and presenting an isolated hypoosmia persisting 30 days after symptom onset. Um, unfortunately, they report that local budesonide efficacy was not demonstrated for persistent hypoosmia related to COVID-19. I'm not surprised because I think by then the, the inflammation is finished. I think the damage to the olfactory epithelium was done long before, and this is not going to make a difference. Yeah, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a good study to read because in the discussion they talk a little bit about that there may be different things going on at different times. So early on, if you do MRIs of people who have um, loss of smell with COVID, you actually can see a lot of inflammation mm -hmm. um, in the olfactory region, um, in the area where the olfactory cells come through the cribriform plate. But as time goes by, that inflammation starts to go down 
And what they're postulating is you may be missing your window. Sure. At this point, you may actually have permanent damage. Yeah, and this um, is 30 days after, um, si I don't remember, 30 days after symptom onset or, yeah. or loss of smell, so it's too late. Yeah, yeah. these were, uh, yeah, I, I don't remember. Persisting what 30 days after symptom onset, Got so. It. Yeah. It's too late. Yeah. yeah. Now, the problem you run into is you don't want to give steroids too early, yeah. right? Yeah. Because then you... But I, and I wonder maybe the timing here, like let's say we have people, so it's week two, you've, you've, you're outside that first week where maybe right. it's going to be okay. They say, I can't smell. If we jump in then, then might could it be it, a yeah. timing? And we get right. the inflammation shut down early, could we then, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So more, more research that needs to be done. And all right, and I will then, before we get to our emails, close with, as I have for about four years now, if you can believe that, no one is safe until everyone is safe. So we're still in the middle of our Floating Doctors uh, fundraiser, uh, August, September, and October. This is our last month, trying to get up to a total donation of 10000 that we can double to give Floating Doctors $20,000 to continue to do the great work that they're doing down in Panama. It's time for your questions for Daniel. You can send them to daniel at microbe.tv. Owen writes, I'm a regular listener to your show. I'm a C34 quadriplegic, 62 years old. I'm at an elevated risk of respiratory issues because of my age and paralysis. Early on in the pandemic, there were plenty of places to monitor the amount of infection in local communities, but much of it has gone away. For the average Joes, such as myself, can you suggest a good strategy for monitoring levels, maybe something similar to influenza monitoring? Also, on today's yeah. show, you had a question asking about the location of the injection. Remember the, yeah. the, the deltoid versus down, lower down, right? Yeah, down on the trapezius. Since my muscles have atrophied and my shoulders are, are subluxed, would you suggest a better muscle for COVID injections? Are the influenza vaccines in, in need of a similar muscle? Okay. All right. So a couple of questions there. So we always leave um, links in our notes, places where you can go and see what's going on. Um, and we we're doing some questions this morning asking different people, like, well, what are they following? Are they following hospitalization levels? Are they following test positivity? Are they following wastewater? Are they seeing what appears in the mainstream media? So no, <laughs> it's, not, it's not what I'm recommending. Um, you know, it's almost counter cyclic, right? Like you never really know what the mainstream media wants to cover that week. Um, but you can, if you go through our links, you can see uh, from the CDC pretty reliable data on hospitalizations. So that's a reliable metric. Uh, tells us what's going on kind of right now, but it's going to sort of tell us what happened with infections a week, week and a half earlier. Um, you can look at wastewater, and that tells you what's, what's really happening in real time, which is going to translate you know, 10 to 14 days later in hospitalization. So yeah, follow the links on our pages. That'll give you a sense of what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, but we're starting to see SARS-CoV-2 um, fall into somewhat of a respiratory uh, pattern, right? We've, we've seen spikes now, um, basically December, January for the last few years. We expect to see that again. It's a respiratory spread uh, pathogen. Um, and then the other, I guess, is where to, where to get those shots. Um, you know, the nice thing is in the FDA approval for the shots, it's deltoid or lateral thigh. So the lateral thigh is sort of underutilized. Um, sometimes it can be a challenge. You go to a lot of pharmacies that are doing it. They don't have people trained to inject in mm. lateral thigh. Um, so that can be a challenge. But it's a great route for someone who maybe doesn't have the muscle mass in other places. Or um, actually a group has reached out to me because they do a lot of breast reconstructions. Maybe a person is struggling with breast cancer. They really don't want them getting the lymph node enlargement up in that region. So sometimes mm. there's medical reasons why that lateral thigh okay. is a so, good option. So this is the lateral thigh just, here? Just lateral thigh. We've sort of moved away from the butt shots. There's like nerves and blood vessels there. I don't know why we were ever doing that. You had to drop your pants. Um, <laughs> but well, you yeah, still just, have to drop lateral. for a lateral thigh, don't you? I tell people to wear shorts, short shorts, oh, okay. the kind of shorts that in my the, girls are not allowed out of the house wearing. In the middle of winter. Huh? <laughs> so <laughs> how far up or down the lateral, th right in the middle? It's right in the middle, right in the meaty lateral thigh. Okay. Yeah. Very good. All right, Lori writes, I have a question regarding measuring of cortisol levels specifically related to long COVID. Does the time of day when blood is taken make a big difference in cortisol level? Also, if an individual who experiences fatigue has blood taken on a day when they're able to get out of bed, feeling relatively good, how might their cortisol level differ from a day when they cannot make it to the clinic to get blood 
drawn as they can't get out of bed? So let's take those two first. Yeah, no, these are these are great questions because this has now come up, right? So the uh, the study with uh, Akiko and David Petrino, um, that was their big thing, right? You draw a line, you could say, okay, these people with long COVID have significantly lower cortisol than people without long COVID, and a lot of people now are asking, like, well, what's going? Is this another? It's a biomarker. Maybe I can start checking things on my patients. Maybe I check a cortisol. Maybe I check serology for EBV and CMV and other things like that. Um, the challenge is exactly what you're bringing up: is that cortisol definitely varies based on time of the day. Mm. So the labs will actually have for you, you know, cortisol drawn between seven and nine thirty. This is our range because that's usually when you see the elevation. In the afternoon, they have a different. Um, and then uh, this is great because this came up just this week. I was talking to a patient about, hey, you know, based on this, they had read this, they had read about this, well, versions mm -hmm. of it in the mainstream, and they wanted to know, should I get a cortisol? And I, and I explained the importance of getting an AM cortisol, and she just said, <laughs> I'm just trash in the morning. How am I supposed to go out and get an AM cortisol? So it's going to be interesting. Uh, the day yeah. that she goes is going to be the day that she feels well. And so, yeah, that's going to be a challenge. You have to have home. You almost physical. need home cortisol where yeah. they can just, you know, at what, 9 o'clock in the morning, 8.30 sure. in the morning, they roll over and the blood gets drawn. Um, and that would be a question. I should probably reach out to Akiko and ask her, like, how did you get these AM cortisols in these people with long COVID, particularly if they had to travel to, like, Mount Sinai or Yale, where they go into a local lab, where they home draws? How did you get them at the same time? How much blood did you need for that, do you know? Not really a lot, just a small amount. So it would be like a, a glucose test also, right? Just a so drop. You, well, you, they're still doing it as, you know, you're drawing one of those. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah, so. Vacutainers, okay. Yeah. All right, uh, then Lori goes on. When having routine blood work done, would non-classical monocytes be measured? I think that's one of the <laughs> groups in the Akiko study. That yeah, is. yeah, the non-classical um, monocytes. A member of my family had COVID in the spring of 2020. Over the next year, she had tests done to try and explain her hypersomnia, fatigue, and brain fog. Of course, this was before long COVID was being widely recognized. She is presently being treated with drugs for narcolepsy, which along with altering her daily activities has helped a bit. At this point, I don't think there's any benefit for her to try and have any tests done to diagnose long COVID as it would not change her medication. Do you agree? Yeah, so, I mean, this is a challenge, I think, for, you know, for at, at this point, uh, validating doing these tests. We're not really sure how that translates into different therapeutics, but hopefully that will come. Uh, some people, though, it, it is nice for them to be able to say, hey, you have a profile that is consistent mm -hmm. with what we're seeing in long COVID. The danger and what a lot of people are worried about is the reverse might happen. They might say, oh, you know, your, your profile, you don't have the elevated EBV serology. Your AM cortisol is not decreased, um, you know. So they're worried they'll be excluded somehow. But uh, the non-classical monocytes, that wouldn't be... That, that would not be part no. of a normal blood yeah. test, yeah. Lisa writes, I'm wondering if I should get vaccinated for shingles. I'm 44, and I had shingles 11 years ago. All right, so let's Okay, so we'll start that. with that. So the, um, the recommendation for the shingles shot is over the age of 50. So we hit 50, I did that, hit 50, boom, went ahead, got my... Um, Got my shingle shot, waited three months, got my second one. You could sort of do it one to six months as a range, three months is reasonable. Um, but for people that have shingles, um, there is evidence that it can prevent someone from having a recurrence. So perfectly reasonable in someone who had shingles in their 30s to consider getting the vaccine. So she wants to know if having shingles counts as being immunocompromised, especially at that young age, right? So it would raise it would raise some sort yeah. of a you know what's going on why did you have in your thirties is there a good explanation is there something in your genetics um, you know fifty percent of us will get shingles at some time in our life. I had a student years ago at Columbia in her twenties and she was on immunosuppressive okay. therapy she got shingles. Yeah, your class was way too stressful. You see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, she, so um, Lisa continues. I know this doesn't work for COVID, but is there a shingles antibody test that can tell me whether I need to get vaccinated? So there, there is an antibody, right? So this is the, <laughs> this is the chicken pox titer, uh, but we don't really do that. We don't really check your titers and decide. It's just a blanket, you hit 50 years old. And P.S., I don't know if this is relevant since I don't think it counts as immunocompromised in regards to the vaccines, but I have ME-CFS, POTS, 
mast cell activation syndrome, fibromyalgia, and von Willebrand type 1. Okay. Does that count for being immunosuppressed, any of those? Well, run through the list again. That was a lot. <laughs> MECFS. -E okay. Right? POTS. Yep. You know what that is, right? Autonomic dysfunction, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Mast cell activation syndrome, fibromyalgia. Okay. okay. And von Willebrand type 1. Yeah, so they're not, none of those fall into like a classic okay. immunocompromised category, um, but they certainly would raise concerns for, for different things. All right, final one is from Jen. Let's suppose someone has the very bad luck of testing positive for COVID a day or two after they received the 2023-24 formulation COVID vaccine. Of course, not due to the vaccine, as that's impossible. <laughs> if this person takes- Maybe due to going to the vaccine center, but no, that's also pretty quick too. It's too quick, right? Yeah. It's too quick. Uh, if this person takes Paxlovid, will it blunt both the virus replication, yay, and also any helpful immune response to the vaccine, bummer. Are there any reasons Paxlovid should be avoided right after vaccination in a COVID positive patient who otherwise would be recommended to receive that treatment? It's a really good question. It is a really good question. <laughs> so let's kind of go through it. So let's, let's first think about the infection, right? So it is, some people used to worry about this with the monoclonal antibodies. So you know, if you got a monoclonal antibody, if you get Paxlovid, if you shut down viral replication, you're not gonna get as robust uh, an antibody response you may not even get as robust a T cell response. That's kind of our goal, right? And, and our recommendations are, if you've been infected, wait three months before you get your next boost. Mm. Um, so that's still there. And that's the goal. The goal is we do not want the virus to replicate. We don't want a big immune response. Uh, but I don't think we've considered that to be enough of a reduction that it doesn't give you, you mm. know, the, the boost in memory. Um, but now let's think about how those, um, how those mRNA, I'm assuming it's an mRNA sure. or it could be a Novavax, we'll go through both. So Novavax, protein, it's already there, immune system's gonna see it. I don't see any interaction with Paxlovid there. Um, let's think about the mRNA. So the mRNA is gonna go through. Um, no again, problem with no Paxlovid. Problems. No, you don't need yeah. a protease to I do any protease of that. for any of this. So yeah, yeah I don't see any problems. No, I would say you should take the Paxlova to avoid getting very sick, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And even if for some reason it interfered with the vaccination, which it doesn't, I would stay, take it anyway and then get vaccinated again later if you needed to. Yeah, three months right. later. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. That's TWIV Weekly Clinical Update with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Vincent. And everyone, be safe. <laughs>